Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm the Credit Manager with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are John Walters and Vaughn Burba. John is currently the Senior VP of Business Development, and Vaughn is the VP of Tech Technology Development for Insurance Applications Group, the company that designed and markets the Essential Staff Care Benefits Program. John and Vaughn each have over 15 years experience in sales, consulting, and management for the employee benefits industry, with the last 10 years specifically focused on the staffing industry. Essential Staff Care is the largest benefits program for temporary agencies in the nation. Now, with over 1,500 staffing companies as clients and over a million applications processed annually, ESC has been recognized as one of the fastest growing businesses for Inc. Magazine's 500, 5,000 for the last five years consecutively. For many staffing firm owners, enrollment and administration of ACA presents the greatest challenge to managing an ACA compliant program. In today's webinar session, John Walters and Von Berba will provide an ACA update to include insightful ways to manage a cost effective ACA program, to include enrollment metrics, new employee direct premium payment options, enrollment challenges, ACA reporting, new options for the staffing industry, and an audit log system. By the end of the session, you'll know how to prepare an ACA compliant program for your staffing firm that uses limited valuable resources while eliminating exposure to tax penalties. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to John. Well, thank you, Amanda. I appreciate all the help there, and uh, you covered most of it there, so I think we're going to already, you know, call this a done deal. Uh, just kidding. We're getting ready to, to get into this a little bit more, and uh, like you mentioned here, uh, you know, what looks like I'm having a little bit of a trouble here. I'm trying to get to, there we go. All right. Sorry about that for it, guys. There, get us back to the title screen. This is what happens when Amanda gives me control of everything. I generally will probably mess it up somehow. Um, but like Amanda mentioned, you know, we are the largest provider of benefits to the staffing industry. Well, we are currently over 1,500 staffing companies and processing over 2 million enrollment forms each year. Um, you know, a couple of uh, other of our accolades there is, you know, uh, we've been named to the Blue Cross Blue Shield President's Honor Council for six straight years, and like she mentioned, uh, we're a five-time honoree of the Inc. Magazine Fastest Growing Companies. Uh, here's a little bit of our footprint of, of the staffing office locations that we service and their employees across the nation. So, um, it, you know, you certainly probably uh, can see there that we're heavier in some markets but not as heavy in others. Um, we have multiple strategic resources that we're allowed to bring to the table, including a multi-year corporate uh, partnership with the American Staffing Association, which gives us a lot of access to their data about the industry. And of course, you know, we support over 20 state uh, and national associations, including um, Ohio, Wisconsin, Missouri, you name it, uh, you know, we're, we're generally sponsoring those shows. Um, and also, we have strategic partnerships with over the, the top 15 staffing-specific vendors, including our good friends at Tricom. Um, so uh, we do have a lot of legal advice we have access to, and we bring that to the table when we're, you know, discussing a lot of these issues. 
Now, just to keep in mind, here's our standard disclaimer that we are not attorneys, neither Vaughn or I. Um, uh, we are coming this from a health insurance advisor background. So if you do have specific questions on your specific uh, business model in regard to the Affordable Care Act, we always recommend that you utilize your own legal counsel that will be, you know, the most familiar with your businesses. Um, uh, Again, uh, you know, Amanda did a great job kind of covering what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be uh, covering, um, you know, just some basics on what we saw throughout the first year of the ACA. Um, and then we're going to start talking about a lot of the administrative challenges that is uh, quite particular to this industry in the, in the staffing market. Um, you know, dealing with the list bill monthly coverages, uh, enrollment and communication challenges for those employees, reporting, and then what we're seeing as some new options on the horizon for everyone. So let's first, just from one company, our company's perspective, what we saw for the first year uh, of the Affordable Care Act and how this affected the staffing industry. Um, throughout the second half of last year, um, we added 493 either MEC, minimum essential coverage, wellness preventative plans, or minimum value plans uh, just in the second half alone of, of 2014. A lot of those groups went in uh, at the last minute, um, you know, uh, generally the last six weeks of the year, uh, a lot of business came on. <clears throat> All of our large national accounts were implemented. And of all the uh, uh, new plans that we implemented there, 40% of them were new clients. Now, a couple of interesting statistics there uh, of, of what our client base is doing, which we think about 1,400, 1,500 companies. Um, you know, this is a great sample based uh, to look at what uh, staffing firms are offering in the market. 57% um, of those groups that, that came aboard uh, offered an MEC wellness plan only. 23% um, uh, offered the minimum value only, you know, with optional uh, benefits there, and then 20% uh, offered both. Okay, uh, a lot of you are familiar with, uh, you know, there was a very popular self-funded plan, um, uh, you know, what, what's called the minimum value light program that was available to the staffing industry. But on November 4th of last year, the IRS came out with a new regulation that basically said these plans uh, needed to have uh, include inpatient benefits. So in a self-funded world, um, you know, one of the things that we insisted on is that the groups fully fund the, those plans. In other words, making sure that there was enough in there that claims were going to be covered and to not kind of play games with the ACA. From there, I'm trying to get to the next slide here, and my computer's running a little slow here, so please bear with me. All right. Uh, sorry, Amanda, my computer seems to be running a little slow there. I'm, uh, I'm getting a bit of a weight wheel okay. trying to advance the slide. Here, let me, there we let go. me take over. All right, All right. very good. Um, for this coming year, 2015, you know, we have announced a fully insured bronze option to, uh, to get a, uh, a little bit away from the self-funded options for this year. Um, it is already filed in uh, the majority of our states where, you know, our clients are based out of, and all states are going to be filed by late summer. Um, so it's going to be in plenty of time for all of our client base uh, for uh, the upcoming enrollment season. All right, so now let's kind of get to the meat of the bone here, which is, you know, a lot of this information, you know, especially if, if well, for a lot of you clients out there and a lot of the companies out there that's been dealing with uh, the ACA for this first year, uh, a lot of you probably experienced some administrative challenges. And uh, what I'm going to get to here is kind of the heart of the matter. Because, um, uh, you know, in a staffing environment, we're dealing with the transient workforce, employees on assignment, off assignment, in between assignments, you know, and of course, that's a lot more common than it would be for a traditional uh, business out there. But all insurance, almost virtually all insurance, is uh, for monthly coverage. And so what that means are coverage premiums are billed and, of course, paid monthly. 
Now, what happens when one of those weekly or biweekly premiums is missed? You basically only have two, maybe three choices. Uh, you either have to make up that missed premium from the employee on their next paycheck, um, which could be in some cases, depending on how many paychecks they missed, could be a substantial amount. Uh, it's either called double deduction or multiple deductions. Or you have to terminate the employee's coverage. Now, that has always been a challenge, uh, you know, in a normal traditional industry where employees are typically long-term. Someone goes on maternity leave or on vacation. Um, you know, typical, you know, you have to double deduct those premiums. Uh, it becomes a major challenge in a temporary environment, and that has been uh, what I call the crux of the matter. You're dealing with a standard monthly premium for monthly coverage. There are no missed premiums in a monthly coverage world. Um, there's no good method of handling those missed premiums when employees do not typically work all month long. So like I mentioned, you know, you only basically have two options. You can double deduct those premiums to reconcile, but generally you're taking a good chunk of an employee's paycheck when that happens, especially at the lower uh, end of the wage scales there. Um, but in a staffing environment, you know, a lot of times that's going to equal angry employees. And considering how much you may actually have to do that, the burden becomes so great that it's almost impossible. The only other method is to terminate the coverage. All right, but you know, again, in a staffing environment, that could also equal very angry employees. Uh, plus, you have some potential legal exposure out there if not done correctly. Um, so, when to terminate a, a coverage for non-payment can generally be very challenging. All right. Essential staff gear to help combat this, we developed a new option. Um, we call it direct pay. Um, we're the only provider out there that uses this method as an option. All right. Um, you know, oh, hold on, went back to the other one. All right. It is based on the same payment method that is utilized by the, a lot of the state and federal exchanges out there. We currently use the same vendor that Blue Cross Blue Shield contracts with for the state exchanges. It's a company out of Texas. Um, um, and basically how this works is, you know, once an offer of coverage is made, uh, that employee decides he wants to sign up for that coverage. Um, we mail them information to their, how, uh, to their home address on how to set up and pay for their portion of that coverage or in the case of a wellness preventative plan, a MEC plan, um, you know, to pay their entire monthly premium, okay? Um, you know, so it's set up outside of your payroll. And we offer this as a free option, uh, you know, for our client base out there. Um, in, in the realm of the minimum value or bronze type plans where a contribution has to be made by the employer based on uh, ACA safe harbors and the affordability provisions, you know, basically those amounts are set up beforehand based on that employee's wage in a lot of cases. Um, and then the employer just simply sets up that ACH account. So each month when that, uh, uh, you know, employee makes his premium payment, the employer is deducted uh, their contribution. So the full amount of premium is taken at one time and then applied for the monthly coverage. All right. You know, the employer is going to receive that draft on the same day of each month. But, you know, here's the kicker. It's only for those employees that actually make their payments on their own plans. So it, it basically, in a nutshell, it keeps your cost to a minimum. If an employee decides he's not going to pay, you don't have to pay. All right. And this will keep a, a good majority of those above mentioned issues, uh, the double deductions, whether or not to terminate that coverage, you know, kind of out of your hand there. All right. Now let's kind of go to another step of, of administration is how do you enroll these plans? Okay, you know, and basically the main thing on the enrollment is verifying your offer of coverage. All right, how does the staffing company verify it has offered its affordable minimum value coverage to 95% or more of its full-time employees for this year? 
Okay, you know, first challenge is who's a full-time employee? With the new, uh, you know, variable hour definitions, look-back rules, uh, and assignment changes from basically a temporary one to a full-time assignment, you know, that's a challenge in itself for a lot of companies is, is identifying who really is full-time uh, employees on this. You know, and if you do not make that offer to 95% or more to your full-time employees based on the ACA, you could be potentially risking the entire A penalty if that is not correct. How do you think this is going to be handled? There's really only two methods. You either can do it paper or you do it through some sort of electronic function. Okay. And once we go to electronic, now we're talking about traditional enrollment systems. We're basically, you know, what we've seen out there in the market, and this is where Vaughn is going to come speak to a lot more uh, eloquently better than I will, um, because he comes from this benefit administration system background. Um, but from what we see out there, the staffing industry very well may be priced out of traditional BIN admin systems. Because just like the coverages you're trying to offer, it is designed for a stable, long-term workforce. The pricing of these types of systems are generally based on a per-employee, per-month factor. And we've seen, based on the capabilities of the system, you know, that can range to three, to those high sixes we've seen, maybe sometimes a little more, per-employee, per-month that goes through the system. And of course, Every employee will have to go through that system. Now, in a staffing environment, you may actually cut 150, a couple of hundred checks a week, depending on your size, whatever that, that number is, but you have a some multiple of that of number of W-2s you're processing. So basically, you're going to be calculating that price on your number of W-2s. That's every employee that comes through your doors would have to go through this, and you're going to pay some sort of per employee per month charge. It can get tremendously expensive very fast. And from what we've seen, enrollment systems out there, you know, are just too high of a cost for the staffing industry and a lot of the margins, uh, very thin margins that staffing firms can uh, operate at. Another part of this is how are you going to deal with your reporting toward the end of the year? As you all know, you've gotten a, you know, a, a lot of new reporting requirements. Uh, uh, due to the ACA. And that includes additional information on W-2. So you now have the box 12 on W-2 reporting. All right. We all know that a lot of staffing firms use W-2 vendors out there, you know, uh, people to handle and process and mail out your W-2s for you. You know, uh, how expensive, uh, what, is there going to be a rate increase on these new uh, reporting requirements for W-2s? That may cause one of your vendors to have to change their system. We haven't seen what those cost increases could potentially be yet. And also you have the IRS code section 6055s and 6056s, depending on whether or not you're going to be using a self-funded or a fully insured plan. And what this refers to is basically your 1094s and your 1095s. All right. Um, you've all uh, seen a lot of those reports. Uh, you know, uh, they've just got finalized uh, over the past couple of months. That's a lot of information that it has to be reported and reported accurately. So uh, we know that there's a lot of pressure on a lot of the vendors out there to be able to provide this type of reporting, you know, depending on who you use. I mean, I know Tricom is going to be, uh, you know, uh, probably helping out in some ACA-related way, but whether or not um, these reports will be part of that, um, you know, uh, you'll be discussing with your vendors out there. Um, you know, the only good news is, is you've got this year um, to, to kind of, you know, get your, uh, you know, process in place on how, who's going to be handling that. Because, you know, you won't be really reporting until the beginning of 2016 for this year, okay? You know, we've added some uh, links there uh, to both SHRM and IRS to go over in a lot more detail uh, a lot of this reporting, okay? So what kind of systems are available that can handle all of that, okay? And from there, you know, this is where Bond's going to come pick up. Uh, uh, he's going to introduce you to what a system needs to have to cover some of these issues, and he's going to be able to uh, take you into a lot more detail from his uh, benefit administration system background.
Thanks, John. Um, would you pass in the controls back to me? I haven't seen anything come over yet. There, now I'm presenter. Let's see if that... Hmm. It's not letting me change slides. Okay, I'll I'll take care of it for you. Sorry, I, there it goes. I guess maybe it's just a delay. It did change. Did you change that, or did it did change for me? I, I did change it. I'll, All right, I'll run it for you. Perfect. Thanks. Well, let's change the next one then. Um, the, the key that we're going to talk about when we go through this ACA. Keep in mind. I'm just talking about the administrative side, the pieces of the puzzle, and, and these are types of the questions that I usually get from, from staffing terms. How are we going to pay for these things? What type of benefit levels needed? Are we trying to solve for the A and B tax and, and things of that nature? The key is how do you become compliant with all these ACA issues? And I use this example all the time. If there's 20 things to do with ACA, Tricom does X number, we do X number, different vendors do different pieces. You're trying to figure out how to solve for all 20. And that's what we try to do is we try to coordinate all of these so that you can be compliant, if you will, as you go through the process. I'm sorry, Amanda, I guess I should have said click again. There we go. When you look at the compliance issues, the verification, the benefits, the enrollment, the administrative piece of it, when you look at all of these, like John said, you look at it and say, how do I do it from a paper point of view or how do I use technology? Go ahead and hit it again right quick. I'm just going to talk about the administrative side. We'll answer any questions you want as we go through this. but. When you start looking at the who you use for legal and, and, and the other pieces we'll get to, I'm just going to concentrate kind of on this area. If you will, one more. The bronze idea. When, when you start looking at the idea of a qualified plan, the reason people are looking at the bronze type of a plan, whether you're looking at a minimum essential coverage or bronze, as John said, this next year, people are looking at the bronze because they, they want the, the, the actuarial 60% equivalent plan that gets you out of the A and B tax, unlimited claims, all of those things that you've heard of. If you go with the bronze, what that really looks like, Dean, how about if I say Dean, will that work? <laughs> Here's kind of what it looks like. This is a national type of a, of a strategy that we got from Milliman. When you look at a medical plan, claims are broken down into, you know, somewhere around 54% of medical claims filed are below $1,000. The red, 30% are between 1000 to 5000 And then, of course, above 5000 is basically the 16%. What we're saying with the bronze, hit it again, please. The bronze plans are designed typically to have a $5,000 deductible range, could be four, could be six, but it's designed to only cover the higher costs. So what happens is the employees are left saying, how do I handle the first dollar cost? Because if I go have a bronze, which again is, gets the employer over the A and B, the employees really don't have that, that, that hole or that gap, if you will. One more, please. So that's what we have to really look at when we start looking at the employees. Can they afford the out-of-pocket expenses of a high deductible plan? And that's why John was saying a lot of people look at the bonds and they still don't enroll because <laughs> I can't afford the $5,000 deductible anyway. One more, please. So what you do if you're going to go to bronze, and we're going to do this current process paper, if you will, the tracking, the reports, the offer, tying into payroll, the carrier feeds, all of that, that's what takes place is you're going to have to kind of coordinate those pieces of the puzzle. One more. So what we do as a company is we look at look at the cost side of what it is for the bronze, you know, well, how much could that save your company by getting out of the A and B tax? How do you show the variable hour, the look back, the communication, the offer, the reports, the research, the training, all of those things, you're going to look at and say there's some kind of cost of X, whatever that cost is to run your comp that process. One more, please. And when you look at trying to do this separately, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit there, 
that's what PricewaterhouseCoopers came out with a study and said, if you do all of these different services separately, it costs you more than if you try to tie them all together. And that's what we recommend for people when you're looking at all of this ACA stuff, try to figure out how to collectively tie the vendors, the, the system together where you can pe put these pieces through a process that you can easily track. One more. So one of the tools that we use, uh, and this is something that, that you guys can do internally, it, it's just that it, it takes a little bit of calculation. What we do is we plug in all of the information into the system, our estimating tool, and you probably have seen tools like this before, but what it does is it looks at all of your hours, all of your employees, which ones are full-time equivalent. You divide that out. You look at what your options could be if you paid, played, or whatever. The thing that's nice about it, when it gives you these numbers, that also helps you when you're talking to your employer groups when they say, are you ACA compliant? If you had to do a buy-up or, or an idea of how much you're going to charge extra, this tool can help you say, hey, it's 17 cents or it's 6 cents or whatever it turns out to be, but it gives your people a chance to explain to clients, I am compliant and this is the reason that I have the idea of going up in, in hourly rate, if that's something that you want to run. But that's a lot of clients are doing that kind of idea to figure out what the cost would be. Next, please. Once you figure that out, then you're going to be looking at it each time you hire somebody how this ugly thing called the variable hour piece. We have a process where you can enter your information. We, we did this in conjunction with ASA where you ask the questions, it gives you weighted averages, it gives you a printout at the end that says, hey, based on the, your temporary staffing, this employee is 100% weighted to be a variable hour employee. And then you can run it through, if you will, your process. So it gives you the ability to actually have your recruiters, if you will, go through and enter in information and you have something to put that stake in the ground that you can show if you get audited, hey, I had a process to determine if it was variable hour or non-variable. Next, please. That information then helps you with the look back. When you have uh, your reporting that's all set out to do from your eligibility, your stability periods, you name it, and it gives you the trend of these employees are getting getting close to that 1560, you're able to, to show your reports and, and have the ability then each month to show the new employees that are eligible. We have the look back information in the database. Next, please. And here's how we do it. When we know that that employee is now become a eligible from an ACA point of view, We'd, we offered benefits and we showed that we offered benefits at time of hire, time of application of well, when you're doing your I-9, your W-4, they could enroll in a benefit, a, a fixed indemnity type benefit, uh, our plan, or any other type of program where you say, hey, here's a limited medical benefit. You do it at the time they're doing your onboarding check. We get something month, two, ten, whatever the months are later that says, hey, this employee is now considered to be full-time, they've, they've gone through their process, what we do is we mail a package to their home, regular mail. And the government may want proof of that you have made the offer. And what we do is we push an email to them. Again, it may not have the exact email because they could change, but we also send a, a package to their home. You've touched the employee now twice with your offer. The address could be wrong, the email address could be wrong, but you've proved to the government that you have now touched your employee twice. You've made the offer. So that's how we help with the process of how does this offer work where you've got to get it to 95% of your employees or face the idea of penalties. We've, we've gone through the variable hour, we've gone through the look back, and we've gone through the offer. That's the process that you've got to kind of map out uh, as we go through this wonderful thing called ACA. Next, please. Another option that we can do yeah, that, that you can try to do as well is you can, um, you can do text, you can do emails, you can do internal through your intranet, or we can push information straight out. So it's just different ways of touching the employees. Next, please. 
once we've gone through all of that, one of the things that we're able to do is we're able to give that employee a ability to log into an electronic system. Here's your last parts of your social, last part of date of birth, whatever determination we use for a login. The employees can see that, and when they log on to the system, they will actually have a short one or two minute video that says, thanks for logging on. Here's how the system works. You would click the next one. The system, they're going to show that we're going to walk them through how to use the system. You're going to update your personal information. We're going to go through the product offering. All you're doing is a one or two minute video where we're doing some compliance. We're explaining that this is going to, you're going to see benefits offered from our company. It walks them through. Next, please. It's going to ask the employees to update their missing information. Maybe they changed addresses. Maybe they changed email. Uh, whatever it turns out to be, we're just updating personal information because this is another way we can push information out to them or that you can push information out to them. They'll see a, vid a video on the benefits. It will explain exactly a, a couple-minute video on how the products work. Next. From a compliant point of view, it will talk about the bronze plan. It will explain where you can get links, where you can get documents, your summary of benefits of coverage, anything that the notices that, that you may have already sent out to them. We've got copies of all of that so that you can prove to the employer, employees you've made the offer. They can either enroll in the plan or, or what. They'll hit the next button. Next, please. Then they'll see the summary. They'll be able to. They'll have, the video will explain. This is what you can review, confirm, and you can either print or email that information where they've waived or they've enrolled. Now you've kind of completed the circle. You've gone through everything from variable, look back, the offer, the enrollment, waive, accept. If they need to, we can also have links out where they can track their claims. Next, please. And, of course, we'll have all the integration built. The system will integrate with payroll, Tricom, of course, all the, any other vendors that you have. The key is the enrollment data is matched up with the reporting data, matched up with the vendors, so that you really have a system of record for benefits. That's the key. Next one, please. You'll be able to show results that says here are the ones that enrolled, here are the ones that did not enroll, here's the ones that started but didn't because these reports will be critical to your different branches. You'll know which ones the process is working, which ones that are, that are not, and you'll be able to show the results right there. You can say, hey, I hit 95%. I can show which ones enrolled and which ones didn't. Next, please. Then, of course, the direct pay. John went into the direct pay, and, of course, you'll get copies of this uh, information. It, it walks you through how the group starts with it, if it's a mech or a bronze or whatever it turns out to be, how they go through the process. The key is that the employer will see the cost that they're involved with, as John said, only if the employee has paid their part. So this direct pay option is very big when it comes to the actual cost that you'll be looking at for these types of plans. Next. Then the kicker. At the end of the year, everybody talks about the 6055s and the 56s and the 94s and the 95s. The key is, on an ongoing basis, these reports at the end of the year, you're, tra you're tracking what's going on an ongoing basis every month, by group, by employee. Then at the end, those reports go to the are sent off. And you've got summary reports and you've got the, the individual reports. The key is you want to be able to have the employee's <laughs> information at the end of the year, which are the 1094s and 5s that everyone is concerned about. Now, those forms can get quite complicated. If you've seen any seminars on these, there's a lot of boxes to check and a lot of information to track. So. With a system, you're able to show which employees enrolled, how they enrolled, when they were eligible, what they did for each month. You're able to have that information, and those reports are created for you. Next, please. 
And that's kind of what we've been kind of going through at a high level today is is what we call the, the benefit system of record. That's really what we talk about at, at our company. Here's the, the two-minute commercial for what we do. We, we tie all these things together, and we call it the audit log system. It talks about the evaluation tools, the products itself, the administrative tools, the log, if you will. It walks you through an automated process. That's what we really call our process where we've tied in to Tricom and everything is you've got a database, which is your benefit system of record. Next, please. So what happens is regardless, you pick a MEC, you pick a bronze, you've gone through what you need to do from an ACA point of view, the additional products. We tie that into the audit log system so that we can take the information from both sides of the house, both product as well as from the ACA point of view. We tie that together, uh, and that's really what we're talking about when we say an audit log system. So when you look at that, Next one, please. Back to that thing of what's your annual cost? Bronze, the variable hour, the look back, the communication, HR, tracking the offer, integrating with payroll, your IRS reports, the changes, training of internal people to, to work with your employees. That cost, you've got to look at. And, and we have clients that are that have gone to the trouble of, of doing all of these steps. They've got a process. They've got internal people that they're using, and that's perfectly fine. We're, we're, we help them with the information that, that they need from us, or you can look at what we call the audit log system that kind of ties all that together. Next slide, please. So the ending slide. Everybody's waiting for this ending slide. And then we can get to some questions. Um, the key is, is when you look at a bronze type of plan to get out of the A and B, you're looking for things to make sure it's to the 60%, but also the participation requirement, if you will. It allows you to spend time on your company versus worrying about insurance, if you will. But, it, but more importantly, it gives your employees options. But the key that we try to make sure that we tried to show today is, is how to keep your contribution and administrative issues at a minimum. So that was kind of the idea when you look at what Tricom has done and what, what we've tried to work with with companies of how we kind of tie all that together. And we're more than happy now. Next slide. To answer whatever questions we need to cover, if it's if it has to do with certain things on direct pay or whether it has to do with reporting or we'll kind of open it up for questions for everyone. But that's kind of the high-level pieces of what, what we were attempting today to cover um, on this ACA subject. I guess we're opening it up for questions now. Okay, so if you have any questions, go ahead and put them or submit them in either the Q&A or the chat feature. I do have a couple questions that have come in, so we'll start with these. Um, could you expand more on any advantages or disadvantages for direct pay versus last bill process? Okay, yeah, that would actually be, uh, yeah, the list bill process. Again, that's the, this is John here, you know, list bill has always been the traditional method of billing and paying for insurance. Um, you know, with this new direct pay model, uh, again, I kind of went through a lot of the advantages a little bit earlier, you know, uh, and like Vaughn mentioned as well, you know, one of the main advantages, it keeps everything outside of payroll. You're not chasing employees down for their missed premium. You're not forced to front that employee's money, the entire uh, entirety of the premium, um, because they missed a particular payment or you may have trouble getting it back from them. Um, again, that may be manageable in a more traditional style industry. Think about your internal staff. It, it may not happen very often with, with people that are working, you know, month in, month out, a long term and all year out, but, you know, uh, imagine you know you're, you're you're cycling through four or five hundred a thousand whatever the number of case may uh, may be um, uh, of temporary employees and that can immediately become a huge uh, uh, hassle and 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 financially you know uh, you know very costly so. <clears throat> 
number one is is this going to uh, the advantage is it minimizes costs because you're only having to pay your contributions on the employees that are actually making their payment. If the employee doesn't make their payment, well, that's kind of, you know, on them. Um, it, you know, uh, it'll be up to them to uh, maintain their portion of their insurance up. Uh, so it'll have a lot of advantages, advantages there. The disadvantage, I would say, is this is... Um, you know, it's twofold. If you're looking to get very high participation in a plan, um, list bill would probably be a better method because when you're taking care of uh, all the premiums and, and you know, uh, doing the favor of the employee, deducting that for them, and it's uh, in manageable chunks, uh, weekly or biweekly, you'll generally get higher participation, um, you know, and therefore a little bit higher cost for, for sticking with that, um, um, you know, whereas the direct pay method is you're only really going to be paying on the people that absolutely want that insurance. Okay, so what we have seen is participation will be a little bit less with the direct pay method. Um, uh, another disadvantage I would say is, um, you know, what we've seen in the marketplace, there's a lot of clients that are demanding on a monthly basis. You tell me, you know, uh, uh, employees who are enrolled in my plan so you can, you know, forcing you to justify what your rate increase was for them for that particular month. Well, with a direct pay method, you only know when someone's actually paid. So uh, a bunch of folks can enroll. You could have 20 folks say, yes, I want the insurance, but each month you may only find out, you know what, only five of them actually took it. So, uh, you know, since that's done on a once a month ba basis, it will fluctuate a little bit. So that's kind of, um, you know, uh, advantages and disadvantages, I would say, uh, from a direct pay standpoint. Um, it's a little bit you know, uh, you would have on a list bill because whether that employee pays or not, you're paying their coverage. You know, that check's got to be made uh, in full. Uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, for higher participation, well, list bill would be an advantage there. If you want, if your goal is lower participation and lower cost, then direct pay is certainly has the advantage there. Okay, another question that has come in. As an administrative savings, as an owner, can I remove the step of figuring out if someone is a variable hour employee and just offer the insurance to all employees as they are assigned to jobs? All right. Uh, would you, could you repeat that one more time? I mean, if I, if I understand the que question correctly, is, um, you know, he's wanting to uh, uh, offer to everybody to try to not have to worry about who's variable hour or not variable hour. Is that, that correct? That's correct. All right. Uh, that's going to have some advantages and disadvantages, just like everything else. You know, obviously the main advantage of making this offer to everybody and not really worrying about the variable hour or who's really full time, you know, that will make things a lot simpler from that side of things for the staffing company. The negative there, though, is most of these plans that are available, uh, you know, bronze or whatever type of plan that you're looking to implement, is going to have some type of participation requirement. Okay, so it's like, okay, your cost is X number of dollars for each individual, but only if you get 30 percent. Well, now what you've done is you've expanded that pool of eligibles. Okay, for example, if you had to get 10 percent of the people enrolled. Do you offer it to your 100 full-timers and they only need to get 10 enrolled, or do you offer it to all 1,000 employees and then have to get 100 people enrolled? So um, administratively, it's a little bit easier, but I think you pay the price a little bit higher on the participation challenges that whatever carrier you're using may impose on you. Okay, um, can you recommend other companies that are similar to yours that work in New Jersey? <sighs> Unfortunately, you know, the only thing I would suggest for companies, uh, you know, in New Jersey is try your local brokers. Um, uh, that would be, you know, they are most familiar with, with their individual state laws and their Department of Insurance regulations. Um, you know, they would probably be your best bet. New York and New Jersey are a couple of tough states when it comes to insurance, and, and so not a lot of companies play in those two states. So when it comes to that, I generally recommend stick with someone local, uh, you know, uh, make sure they're very, uh, whoever you speak with, though, you want to make sure that they understand your business, the challenges that you're going to face such as this, 
um, you know, participation, whatever that case may be. And then my last suggestion would be that whatever price that they quote, make sure you get it in writing. Um, uh, uh, and also, but more importantly, what happens if you do not achieve your participation requirement? Uh, we, we saw a recent case, um, this wasn't New Jersey, uh, of course, but, you know, hey, it was a very reasonable quote, you know, they had to get 30% participation, but there was a major kicker. If they did not achieve that 30% participation, their, uh, uh, their premiums increased astronomically. It went from something reasonable like $450, $500 a month, something like that, to over $1,100 a month if they did not hit their participation after open enrollment. So try to be very, very to the point with whoever you're dealing with on what happens in case I don't make, you know, the level of participation that carrier needs. Are you seeing many staffing companies offer ACA compliant bronze level plans or better and paying 50% of the employee's premium? If so, what has been the advantage the average total monthly premium for employee only coverage? I mean, it's going to vary slightly from state to state, and, and you know, uh, insurance is very regionalized in a lot of cases. Uh, a lot of factors come into play there. What is the average age of your population? What is the gender mix? Uh, so, you know, what type of business uh, you're doing? If you're staffing for a bunch of coal mines, you're probably going to get a much higher rate than if you're staffing clerical and administrative personnel. Um, when it comes to paying the portion of the employee's premium, that kind of varies. Um, obviously, you know, most of the clients we deal with, they want to pay the minimum, you know, the minimum amount they have to, and that's just to get to that affordability provision throughout the ACA, meaning that the employee cannot pay more than 9.5% of their wages. Whether that equals a half of, uh, you know, 50% or more of that employee's premium is debatable in a lot of cases, depending on the wages we're talking about here. Um, but yes, we are seeing more and more staffing firms, you know, want to offer, you know, bronze level plans if at all possible, because that is the only way for sure to eliminate both A and B penalties. Um, even though that has been a big challenge for the industry, uh, you know, it seems everybody wants that. And then secondly, a very strange phenomenon has been happening as well. Even for groups that are small enough to not even be considered a large employer and not subject to the Affordable Care Act, we're seeing a tremendous amount of market pressure coming from their clients demanding that they offer a bronze level or some sort of higher, higher uh, uh, you know, ACA compliant program, even though the law may not necessarily apply to them. We've see, I, I deal with that almost on a daily basis from uh, companies that may only have like 40 full-time equivalents. You know, they're, they're you know, just starting out or uh, only been in business for a year or so. The law doesn't even apply to them, you know, um, but their clients are demanding that they make this offer of coverage. And that, that is coming from a fear of the common law employment issue um, that is out there. Uh, uh, you know, one thing I like to say is the legal industry has probably, you know, um, gotten the most out of the ACA than anybody else. Um, so be, uh, some of you are probably familiar with that or experiencing yourselves. So uh, we're seeing a lot of that, that your clients are, you know, pushing you to offer bronze level plans, even though you may not even have to. I would say one other thing. It's a great question. Um, keep in mind, even if the employer is paying 50% of the coverage, it's still going to boil down to how the carrier can spread the risk. So if they're, they're going to be concerned on how many people participate, not necessarily if the employer is paying a higher percentage, it's still going to boil down to how many are participating because that's how they're going to spread their risk. Correct. How do I find out what the employer's contribution is for a, black, a bronze plan? Well, that's going to vary once you get your quote and they tell you what the employee or individual only coverage is. 
you know, you'll calculate, uh, you know, like, kind of like what Vaughn mentioned earlier in a lot of these uh, estimating tools that are available and out there, you'll calculate what it is uh, the maximum your employees can pay for individual coverage, and then you'll base your contribution on the difference. Um, you know, uh, it, it really is going to vary by state, location, type of business. So the only way to know for sure is, you know, once you actually start getting back some quotes from some carriers. But the amount that the employer is going to pay, when you think about it, is 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 capped where the employee is only paying up to nine and a half percent. So whatever that rate is, you can you know do the math from that point of view. Uh, you're paying the difference. And I would add this as well. Uh, you know, now that Bond brought that up, you know, participation is going to play a huge price. Uh, play, pay, pay, you know, play a huge part in all this. So let's say, for example, you got an excellent rate of 300 bucks a month for an individual coverage, um, you know, uh, but you had to get 50% of your eligible people to enroll in it or your price goes up to $600 a month. So that has to be factored into your calculations. Uh, a lot of times it may be better to pay a higher price for a much lower participation rate than it is to pay a low price for a boatload of people that have to enroll. Okay. If an employee is temp to perm and works only 12 weeks or 480 hours, will they be considered a variable employee or do we count them full time but only send the enrollment information after the administrative period? Great question. Um, this is something that has been discussed, at, uh, you know, at length over the past couple of years, uh, you know, with the American Staffing Association, and it's it. There's a bit of a gray area here. This is something that uh, that IRS, ERISA, uh, and the ACA do not address very clearly. Now. If you know, if you have a division, or if your your business specializes in temp to perm, uh, you know you have a couple of advantages. Kind of like what you mentioned here. Nine times out of ten, with that if that employee's working ninety days, and then they always go permanent with their client company. You know, uh, you know you're sitting pretty from the fact that hey, nine times out of ten, you know even if this person elects coverage you know, I'm probably not going to have to pay, you know, anything at all uh, because they'll be going to the client company. And to get to the answer to the question here, I would count that employee as full time. If they are working on average 30 hours a week over that 12-week period, you know, which is typically very, very common in an attempt to perm scenario, um, you are much safer classifying that employee as full time because once they go permanent with your client company, that is going to be a full-time position. So, I mean, that's the easy part to answer. Classify them as full-time. The, the gray area comes in on your client side, all right, because there is no clear answer out there when that employee transitions from your employment to your client company's employment on that 90-day mark or, or roundabout. Okay, there is no clear answer if your client company could then subject them to an additional waiting period. All right, so if you're using the 90 days, you know, for your company, um, now then they go to your client company, does that client company get an additional 90 days? I, we have not been able to get a straight answer, and, and a lot of the legal counsel we've spoken to are, are a little scared to, to broach that one because that's a bit of a gray area. Now, the disadvantage of the temp to perm situation, other than that gray area for your client companies, there will be on occasion that those employees that for whatever reason stay a little bit longer with you than that 90-day transition, okay? So this is something you have to be extremely careful on. If that employee works for you, they're going through that 90-day period and they elect to have coverage and for whatever reason, that employee stays longer than the 90 days, that coverage needs to go into effect by the 91st day. Um, otherwise, it could be a very potential, you know, uh, uh, legal issue if an employee pushes it, because basically uh, one of the rules for all this is an employee cannot go longer than uh, the first day of the fourth month without their coverage being in effect. 
So that's why most uh, carriers implement, you know, that they're, you know, once an offer is made and an employee accepts it, it goes into effect by or before the 91st day. Okay, so that's something to be pay particular attention to in a temp to perm environment is on those occasions where the employee for whatever reason stays with you a week or however long, a little bit longer. Okay. If there is a reason that a staffing service is found not compliant using ESC's process, do you stand behind my staffing service and help with the legal ramifications? Vaughn, I'm going to let you take that one. Thanks. Um, <laughs> short answer is, if I'm hearing the question correctly, they're asking from a legal point of view, are we going to stand behind uh, what we're showing as the solution? We can prove the, the, the offer. We can show when they were low. We can prove any of that. Are we saying that we will pay for legal fees or fines? The answer is no. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't do that. We can prove and we can give you the audit trail, but if I heard the question, are we going to stand up and go from a legal point of view cover costs, the, the, the answer would be no. We can prove the, the offer. We can prove it was waived or enrolled. We can show when. That we can, we can back up, but as far as if you're asking from a legal point of view, um, cost that answer would be no. Did I did was that the was that the question? Um, yeah. So it does sound like you are standing behind the process itself, indicating that your process is legally compliant and that the notifications and all of that are are going to go out when they need to. All of that information is accurate, but that you wouldn't be paying any legal costs, but you do stand behind the product as far as it being compliant. That is correct. And you're and able I'll, to I'll say documentation. It, right. And this is John. I'll say it like this. We will guarantee, uh, you know, our processes and everything based on the data we receive. If you put them through the system, we'll be able to verify everything. But if we have a, you know, a potential client out there that for whatever reason, you know, we find out 10 or 15 percent of their employees don't go through the process, then hey, our, our our stuff is just like any other software agreement, uh, you know, out there. Uh, it will be, you know, just as good as the data we receive. Okay, makes sense. Um, are there um, B penalties assessed against the company, not the employee, or are the B penalties assessed against the company rather than the employee? That is correct. The B penalty is a, is a part of the employer shared responsibility rules uh, under underneath the employer mandate, and then uh, any penalties that an employee would face for not getting a, at least a minimum essential coverage, um, you know, that's referred to as the individual mandate. That's going to be based on basically their their household income. Okay. And we'll take one last question. Um, what process should our company have in place to be compliant with ACA? Well, that's going to be based on, you know, the company, your size, the type of business you, you do, you know, kind of like Bond mentioned, and I'm going to let him, you know, finish this one up. But, you know, basically do a cost analysis. Figure out you know, at least a good estimate of what this is going to cost you to do internally, how many people you have to hire versus, you know, putting it up against a, a, a system or vendor you can use. I think that summarizes it pretty well. I think the key is when you look at that, besides looking at product, you, you've got to look at the variable hour, you have to look at the look back, you have to look at the reporting, and you have to look at the cost, if you will, specifically of how you're doing the offer, mailing it to their homes, the cost of reportings at the end of the year, the 1094s and 5s. Those are the processes that people have to look at and say, and, and, and hey, there's companies that say, I can do all of that. I've got people in place to do it. We're just saying there's, there's other options options as well, but those are the key elements that you're going to have to look at to say, here's how I'm going to perform my own audit trail. Absolutely. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes. Yes, it does. I have gone ahead and put up the contact slide information. Um, feel free to reach out to either John or Vaughn directly if you had any other questions or if you'd like their assistance um, in any other way regarding the administrative piece. 
Um, I'd like to thank our participants in today's webinar, as well as John and Vaughn for sharing their knowledge of the administration of ACA. The recording of this webinar will be available on our website at tricom.com under the Resources, Industry, Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session, which will be held on June 25th, presented by Talent Resources, entitled How to Hire Better Salespeople. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.